Welcome to the Australian National University's Malaysia Update 2020. I'm Stuart Nixon, a PhD student at the Crawford School of Public Policy, ANU. This biennial update conference is brought to you by the ANU Malaysia Institute, uh, based in Canberra, with today's panel all joining you from Malaysia. The Institute was established in 2016 to develop research and collaboration on Malaysian politics and society, but is based on a long history of uh, Malaysian scholarship at the ANU. More information about the Institute can be found at malaysiainstitute.anu.edu.au. This year, we are working with Malaysia Kini and the Institute for Democracy and Economic Affairs in Kuala Lumpur on the theme of alternative visions for Malaysia. Although this conference is held virtually, the ANU is built on Indigenous Australian land of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, and we acknowledge and pay respects to their elders past and present. Today it is my pleasure to host the economic update, Impact of COVID-19 on Vulnerable Groups in Malaysia, which begins with a 30-minute keynote address from Dr. Muhammad Abdul Khalid. This will be followed by a 60-minute discussion with expert panelists and a Q&A session in which you are all encouraged to participate. Introducing my esteemed fellow panelists, Dr. Muhammad Abdul Khalid is a former economic advisor uh, to former Prime Minister Tun Dr. Mahathir Mohamed, a member of the Economic Action Council from 2019 to 2020. He has served as a consultant to the World Bank and numerous UN organizations and has held positions at prominent institutions, including the Kazanar Research Institute, Securities Commission of Malaysia, Institute of Strategic and International Studies and UNDP Malaysia. Dr. Mohammed is currently the Managing Director of boutique consulting firm DM Analytics, a research fellow at University Kabangsan Malaysia and the author of the best-selling book, The Colour of Inequality. Joining him is Prof. Dr. Jomo Kwame Sundaram, Senior Advisor at the Kazanar Research Institute with a long and storied history of contributions to economic thought in Malaysia and internationally. He was a professor at the University of Malaya for almost two decades before becoming UN Assistant Secretary General for Economic Development, following which he held senior positions at the Food and Agricultural Organization and Institute of Strategic and International Studies. More recently, he was a member of the Council of Eminent Persons, appointed to advise the former, former government on major reform priorities. Last but certainly not least, Trisha Yeo is the CEO of Ideas, a public policy think tank here in Malaysia, where she, was previous, where she has previously held positions of Chief Operating Officer and Fellow. She's also a PhD candidate at the University of Nottingham, Malaysia, examining federal state relations and opposition subnational durability within dominant party authoritarian regimes. She was formerly research officer of the Selangor Chief Minister and has previously served as director of the Asli Centre for Public Policy Studies. I now cross to Dr. Mohammed to provide the keynote address. Hello. Thank you for the kind invite um, to share with you my views on the impact of COVID to the vulnerable group in Malaysia. How I'll do the session today is as follow. First, I will share quickly what's the macro impact, in particular to the economy. Then I'll focus on the topic of the day, what, who are those that are impacted and how are they uh, impacted due to COVID. And finally, I will share uh, some recommendations or my views, how, what can we do to address this. First, on the macro on the economic impact. The economic contraction from due to this crisis never happened before. In fact, when the economy contracted by a negative 17% in the second quarter, is the worst that we ever uh, experienced. It uh, worse than, in fact, worse than the most difficult period during Asian financial crisis. Um, it worse than global financial crisis of 2008. It worse than the economic contraction of our neighboring countries, Thailand, Singapore, uh, Indonesia, um, and even Philippines. We contracted by 17%, Singapore 13, Thailand 12, Indonesia 5. Hmm? The impact to Malaysia is worse than we have experienced and worse than uh, uh, other countries in this region. 
and the impact is quite um, is quite prominent in the labour market. The number of unemployed has increased about 50% between last year and in August. We look at the unemployment rate. Unemployment rate now, although it has moderated a bit, compared to two months ago, is still higher. In fact, it is the highest in 30 years. Again, higher than during the Asian financial crisis and higher than global financial crisis. So at the macro side, economy has contracted, number of people without jobs has uh, increased. What are then the impact to vulnerable groups? Who are the vulnerable groups that are impacted due to COVID? Uh, maybe I would share who are not impacted. Those who are not impacted from this crisis are two groups, the rich, were not impacted at all. Another group is the politician in this country. They got jobs, so they're not uh, impacted. The rest, majority of Malaysians are impacted. Why do I say majority of Malaysians are impacted? Malaysians, while they are not many are poor, poverty rate about 5.66%, .6, but bulk of them are vulnerable. If there is shock, or there are shocks, health shocks, uh, employment shock, they would fall into poverty. Ben Negara says 75% of Malaysian cannot even raise 1,000 during, uh, uh, during emergencies. And if you look at the poverty rate, poverty rate now 5.6%, but if you lose 700 ringgit of your household income, the poverty rate will increase by additional 11% or additional 800,000 households. If one household has Four members, that additional 3.2 million would fall into poverty just by losing 700 ringgit. And many has lost or the income reduced by 700 ringgit during the crisis, during the MCO because they cannot uh, go to work, in particular the informal sector. So majority uh, impacted. But if you want to slice it further, who are the most uh, impacted? I would put, I would list down a few. Number one, those informal workers. Hmm? Informal workers, in easy terms, if you want to understand, are those like Machikia, Bukan uh, Nyang Bekerja Sendiri. Informal workers, the most impacted. Number two, children. Children are also the most impacted, both in terms of, in terms of education and also in terms of health. I will explain later. Number three, the other groups that are most impacted are migrant workers and refugees the third group they're most uh, impacted. Number four, those who are impacted are the young ones, especially the young graduates. So informal worker, children, migrant, refugees, and young uh, graduates. Let me go slightly in detail. For the informal worker, if you lose your job, which many have lost their job during MCO, you are not protected. Compared to many of us, many Malaysians, about 80% are employees. If you are employees, if you lose your job, most probably you contribute to employment insurance scheme with SOXO. If you lose your job, the insurance will kick in. You will, get, you will receive, depending on the, on the period, about 80% of your last drawn salary for the first two months, until 30% of your last drawn salary in the last uh, two months of the six months period. So you get something, you have room to breathe if you are employees. But if you are self-employed, you much care, you expose because you are not contributing to SOXO. Our policy is not that compulsory for people in the informal sector to contribute. And when we look at SOXO data, out of 100 of much care, those in informal sector, how many contributed to SOXO? Out of 100, about 3 contributed to SOXO. If 100 workers or employees lose their job, they're protected for 6 months. Insurance kicks in. But if you match it here, only 3 protected. The rest, you on their own. That's why we see uh, data from Department of Statistics: 6, those who lost their job, the most are the self-employed because people uh, they cannot do their business. So one group that heavily impacted is the self-employed. Uh, 
the other group that are impacted are the children. The children are impacted in two ways, both negatively, one in terms of health, the other in terms of education. In terms of health, they have issues in malnutrition. Globally, the level of stunting has been on the decline, but in Malaysia, it has been on the increase. In fact, the level of stunting among Malaysian kids here is higher than in 1999. Country is getting richer, much, much richer, but the kids are doing, uh, not, uh, are doing worse in terms of health. In fact, for certain groups, we should already consider it's a health crisis. On average, about one in five of Malaysian kids uh, consider stunted or stunted. But for certain groups, kids in certain states, in Kelantan and in Terengganu, one in three are stunted. In fact, if it's above 30%, it should already be called a crisis. So we already have existing crisis before COVID uh, happens. The kids, the malnutrition among our kids has been increasing. To put things in perspective, the level of stunting in Malaysia among Malaysian kids is worse than poorer countries such as in Gaza and even in Ghana. Our kids, it doesn't make sense. How can a country richer than some African countries, richer than war-torn countries, our kids are doing much worse. Hmm? That has been going up. The level of stunting has been going up. And it's not just a matter of not enough height of two inch. It's about mental development, which have a long-term impact. This is before COVID. During COVID, they cannot go to school. 500,000 of Malaysian kids got uh, meal supplement in school. Rancangan makanan tambahan. About 500,000. During COVID, when school closed, they do not get this health, uh, nutrients, uh, nutritional food. Is it being supplemented at the house? There's a study done by UNICEF uh, on the impact of COVID to families in low cost flat in Kuala Lumpur. And we see because of the job loss and reduction of income, they have to adjust their diet. And what do we see? Less protein and 40% increase in instant noodle consumption. They're already not doing well, but because of COVID, they're doing much worse because they don't have uh, uh, good nutrients. 40% increase in, in, in uh, Maggi Mee or instant noodle consumption. So in health, it's going to be much worse, hmm? number one. On education, the same thing. There's a study done to look on online learning, impact of online learning. How many of Malaysian kids or household have laptop? It's very small. Only one in 10 have laptops. One in three has no equipment whatsoever. Uh, sizable number have to use the mobile phone of their parents. So online learning doesn't work for bulk, uh, a bulk group of Malaysians. So in health terms, they're not doing well. In education, they're not going to well, do well. So the, this group, the children, is the most uh, 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 impacted. Another group that most impacted is shameful, really, is the impact on migrants and refugees. Yeah. Even before the crisis, you look the way we treated the refugees. It's not, it's rather inhumane. The living conditions are extremely bad. We took advantage of them despite they developed this country. And now we seeing because of our failure, a lot of COVID cases now because of uh, migrant workers, undocumented workers started in the, let's say, in the prison or in the detention centre. We should have addressed this much earlier based on Singapore experience. Singapore protected their citizens very well, but they ignore to certain extents those foreign workers and the cases because of foreign workers. Virus don't discriminate. It doesn't matter your nationality. And the way how we treat our migrant workers, refugees, in their living condition, this is bad for, uh, for health. So they're also not doing well. Huh? And many of them scared to go for uh, health checkups because they're scared they'll be caught and be repatriated back. So impact on 
informal workers quite bad, especially on protection, on children, education and health, and also on migrant on uh, refugees. The other group that are impacted are the young ones, the young graduates in particular. There's a statement issued uh, recently, the number of unemployment among graduates will increase because economy contracted, there's not many job opportunities. So what do we do with our graduates? The number of young graduates, or rather unemployed graduates, would increase to about one out of four. So we will have a, a, a group of graduates without jobs. Out of four, only one will have uh, uh, 25 percent unemployment rate and those who get a job doesn't mean they're doing well because there's a serious uh, issue of underemployment in malaysia even before crisis if people say oh they're, they're lazy they're choosy that's not true it's not big, uh, based on facts if you look at the percentage of graduate who work in low or mid-skilled sector has been increasing they're not choosy the reason why they cannot get their jobs or being paid uh, optimally because we don't create high income jobs year 2000 for every one graduate that we produce there's one high uh, high skill job no for now or last year for every one high skill job that we produce we produce four graduates so the creation of uh, high income jobs doesn't catch up with the number of graduates that we produce so he's going to have a serious implication in the long run. So four groups, informant workers, children, migrant, uh, refugees, and also young graduates. I would add the last group, they are vulnerable, or has been negatively impacted by the COVID, which is single mothers. Single mothers, if you take, let's say, in low-cost flat in Kuala Lumpur, one in five of the head of household are single mothers. Hmm? And the data from UNICEF uh, shown for this group, the highest, the, the, the biggest impact is on mental health. 80% of them uh, stated that they are mentally stressed because of COVID. And one of the main factors of stress for them is unsure about the future. Either they can provide for their children meal and provide for the children education. And this is also a new uh, challenge for Malaysia in terms of uh, addressing mental health. So if I can summarize those groups that impacted are the informal uh, workers, there's no protection. The children impact on education and health, on migrant refugees, on graduates, young graduates, and also on single mothers or ibu uh, tunggal. So those are the group that uh, impacted then what can we do or rather what have the government done and what can we do to address this then what what do we do uh, to address this how do we ensure that those impacted will get help will get uh, protected number one we should spend more uh, we do not spend enough to address the impact of this crisis. Yes, uh, we spend total package about 300 uh, billion, but if you slice it, the direct fiscal injection from the government is about 45 uh, billion ringgit. In re relative to the size of the economy, our injection is very small. Singapore spend four times more than Malaysia. Thailand spend double than uh, Malaysia. Philippines spend more than Malaysia. We spend too little. If you are self-employed, you only get one-time assistance. Those much here, those the most impacted, you only get one-time assistance of about 1,600 uh, uh, ringgit. One off. And this amount is too small. If you are a worker, government give a wage subsidy. A wage subsidy is also quite small. We give equivalent of about 25% of median wage. Singapore give 75% of the 
of the wage to assist the firm. So for own account workers, we give one time. For the workers, we give quite a small uh, uh, number. So although the size seems big, but it's too thin to make a, a meaningful uh, impact. Even assistance to uh, SME, soft loan for SME, is quite underutilized. Um, the total SME uh, that received the soft loan is very small, doesn't even reach 5%. And when you compare to Singapore, our neighbor down south, the way they did it, if you are workers, you get 75% of your salary. If you own account workers, you get monthly assistance all until end of the year uh, for you to, to have a room to breathe before uh, to manage the crisis. So we should spend more and we should spend on, in particular on self-employed because they have no protection whatsoever. That's, if I want to choose, I would choose that uh, group, number one. Number two, uh, and we say we cannot spend because we do not have money. Yes, we have money. We can borrow. Our borrowing is still low. Our deficit is still low. Singapore budget deficit from a surplus uh, last year, it is going to be double digit. In fact, they are targeting about 15% deficit this year. We are too obsessed. There is like a fetish on ensuring deficit too low or rather deficit 5 to 6 percent. Why we have to be 5 to 6 percent? Oh, because rating agencies say you cannot increase. We are too obsessed to become a servant to uh, foreign rating uh, agencies. What matters is the well-being of the rakyat. If you need to spend, you spend whatever it takes. So we can spend. Number one, if you don't have money, we can borrow. We have room to borrow. In fact, the interest rates now is too low. It doesn't make any sense if you don't borrow. Number one. Number two, there's fiscal amendments that you can do, in particular on tax. Tax rate and tax coverage in Malaysia is very low. Total, uh, total tax, tax revenue per GDP in Malaysia is about 12% of GDP. OECD countries is three times higher. Uh, personal income tax is about 2% of GDP. In rich country, OECD country, four times higher. So a tax collection of e economy is quite small. And many people do not pay tax. Our uh, tax is not really progressive because all sources of earnings are not treated fairly. Earnings from employment are tax, earnings from capital are mostly not tax or rather not tax at all. And tax is not progressive, it's pro-capital, it's pro-rich rather than pro-workers. We, uh, we can revise the tax to make sure that it's more progressive. Uh, the tax is still too low and many do not pay tax. Last year when the government uh, wanted to do this or did the special voluntary program, so if you have account overseas, register with us. And the government sent letters to all of them. About 500,000 Malaysian or, uh, letters were sent for those Malaysians that have accounts overseas. And to put things in perspective, when the government increased tax rate last year or the year before to 30%, the top marginal tax rate, those who earn more than 2 million ringgit, the number of Malaysians who reported income more than 2 million ringgit in this country is only 2,000 people. We sell 25,000 Mercedes last year. It doesn't make sense because the rich do not pay or they get the loophole. So tax should be revised and you get additional revenue. It's not to punish, we have to be clear, it's not to punish the rich but to ensure the tax is fair. So we have money to help the poor. So we can spend more either by borrowing, the interest is very low, or we uh, relook our, our tax system, number one. Number two, we need to protect those vulnerable groups, in particular the self-employed. Self-employed not contributing to EPF, not contributing to SOXO. We encourage them. It's optional. 
is not compulsory. It should be made compulsory. We should not differentiate types of employment. Doesn't matter you are uh, self-employed or your employees, you must contribute. There are uh, workers. And number two, if we come to the third part, what can, what can we do? So when the crisis happens again, if there's income shock, employment shock, whatever shock uh, it may, you are uh, protected. So there's a social protection. That's number two. Finally, what is important is to ensure that institution works, which means we have good people and we have good laws. We cannot have laws or rules that only applicable to the poor and not applicable to the rich. We also need to ensure those with high integrity are in charge of these trust agencies to ensure what needs to be done is being executed uh, fairly and optimally. Without good people, without good institutions, you can have good policies, but it will still uh, fail. I think I will stop here. I'll share what's the impact of uh, earlier, the impact of COVID to the economy, who are the groups that are impacted and what uh, can be done. Uh, thank you for listening. I look forward to uh, the discussion by the panelists and uh, letter, question and answer. Thank you. All right, well, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to the live part of the event and thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mohammed, for uh, your presentation. And there's so much we can digest from that, their videos and microphones. Uh, by way of introduction, uh, just some housekeeping rules. So we have the Q&A button at the bottom. Um, strongly encourage you to raise some questions and, and provoke some debate. And we'll try to, I'll try to feed them in as best as I can to the, the, the discussion we'll have today. One interesting thing, I guess, or by way of introduction is it's staggering how quickly things change. When I was uh, preparing for this a few weeks ago, uh, the situation in Malaysia, pandemic-wise, was fairly contained. Uh, economic data was recovering quite quickly, in fact, staggeringly quickly in terms of month-on-month. -month. So we were, we were quite excited by that and uh, with the easing of restrictions, moving through different types of movement control orders, uh, there was a degree of optimism, I think. And how quickly that's changed in the sense that now Malay livelihoods is getting much more complicated for policymakers and the government. Um, and it's and the topic today is around vulnerable Malaysians and it's the Malaysia the vulnerable Malaysians as uh, Dr. Muhammad pointed out are the ones that are facing the greatest hardship through the the crisis and uh, if the response is not as effective as it could be. There were three, uh, I guess, key uh, points or three key stats that jumped out at me from the presentation. The first one, um, un unemployment at the highest rate in 30 years. I mean, that's obviously a pretty scary statistic for everyone. Um, in nominal terms, it's a quite small number relative to a lot of countries, but in the Malaysian context where social protection is much, uh, much less extensive, it's a very uh, significant number. Also that 75% of Malaysians can't raise a thousand ringgit, which is about 340 Australian dollars or 240 US dollars. And uh, finally, that if household income declines by about 700 ringgit, uh, that's another 11% of households in poverty. So there are three statistics that jumped out at me and are quite striking. Um, so what we'll do is to, to kick things off, I'll, I'll pass over to, to Prof Jomo to speak for about three to five minutes on uh, his reactions or other points that he'd like to make. And straight after that, we will we'll go to, to Tricia as well for, for her observations. And then we'll get into a, a more free flowing sort of Q&A discussion. Over to you, Prof Jomo. Thank you very much, uh, Stuart, for this kind invitation. Uh, let me get straight to the point since you've given me three to five minutes. I think there are four issues which we might want to quickly mention. Uh, first, I think from a comparative public health point of view, uh, Malaysia has had certain advantages being located in Southeast Asia, 
having experienced a number of virus epidemics in the recent past, uh, but unfortunately did not leverage on that very effectively. And part of the reason I think uh, is now undisputed is because we lost over a, about a month uh, from, the, from the second half of February uh, into the middle of March uh, due to the, essentially the palace coup which took place and resulting in the change of government. Uh, related to that as well, we should recognize that in the rest of East Asia, uh, including relatively poorer countries such as Vietnam, Laos, uh, even Kerala in Southwest India and so on, uh, they have been able to contain the contagion, uh, which hit them much earlier uh, without resorting to stay in shelter lockdowns, which are a very, very blunt instrument for dealing with, with COVID-19. Uh, the second set of points would relate to macroeconomic considerations. I think one has to recognize that stay in shelter lockdowns uh, are basically uh, are um, self-inflicted. Okay, so are, the, the, the disruption at the macroeconomic level is certainly self-inflicted. And, uh, but it, it also means that it is not very easy to simply turn the button off and on. Uh, you to, for the economy to restart after a stay in shelter lockdown is not terribly easy, especially for relatively small businesses, but arguably even for larger businesses. Uh, another important consideration is the fact that Malaysia has always been a relatively open economy, at least since the colonial period. What this has meant is that we have been especially vulnerable to supply chains, uh, uh, disruptions, and this has been exacerbated by the fact that both uh, President Trump and the former Prime Minister Abe of Japan uh, both uh, 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 decided to, to punish uh, China in different ways uh, by withdrawing investments from China. And insofar as Malaysian uh, uh, production is integrated into supply chains involving China, this has been very, very disruptive. Um, now, a third consideration, of course, is that we have had, uh, as Dr. Mohamed emphasized, uh, a, a, a relatively modest uh, fiscal response. Uh, that's, uh, uh, to put it very mildly, uh, um, the bulk of the public uh, sector of the government response uh, uh, was essentially, essentially monetary. And the monetary measures, which accounted for about 90% of the value of the measure, uh, really do not affect many people outside of the formal sector uh, because it is extremely difficult even for medium-sized enterprises, let alone uh, family enterprises and so on uh, in the informal sector to access uh, sec uh, a credit from the formal economy. Hence, the appeal for extending the moratorium uh, has become quite popular in many circles. Um, the other point to be made is that we run the risk, like many other economies in the world, of COVID-19 recessions becoming depressions if we do not act rapidly enough, if we do not act, act strongly enough. And this is, I think, very important to recognize. The third thing is, of course, the impacts. I would say that, uh, that, that besides those mentioned earlier, uh, we have to recognize that many public sector employees uh, have come through reasonably well. They were provided with an additional allowance. The big private sector has also done reasonably well insofar as the government has provided some degree of uh, financing uh, to keep people on the payroll. Unfortunately for the rest of the economy, there has been very little provided for them. Part of the reason, of course, is that we have adopted a measures, looking at the West, looking at the, uh, what, how Western economies have responded to the crisis and, and basically mimic them, rather than looking at the nature of the Malaysian economy, where the people are who, are, who are working and doing what, and how to best uh, adjust. So this is very important, not only for relief measures, but also for, for recovery measures. Um, the other point, I think, which needs to be made uh, in this connection is the impact which Dr. Mohamed has elaborated on, on the informal sector. The informal sector is huge in the Malaysian economy, and, and we are talking about well over half of the, of the labor force 
even if you exclude the estimated six to seven million uh, foreign workers who are in Malaysia, of whom only two million or so are documented, another four to five million are undocumented. So all this um, uh, is, has to be seen in, in, in the bigger mix of things, but since I'm running out of time, uh, let me stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, over to you, Trisha. Good morning um, to those of us in Malaysia and good afternoon for those of you in Australia. Um, thanks very much to ANU for inviting me and I will also get straight to the point. Um, so thank you to Dr. Mohammad Khalid for presenting what I think is a very comprehensive overview um, of the impact of COVID on the vulnerable groups in Malaysia. Uh, I think I'll just um, lay out some of my points this way. So I will uh, speak on three additional issues apart from what he has already mentioned and then I will uh, talk about three uh, policy sort of perspectives or solutions if you like um, of how to address these and then I have two additional points. So my three um, additional issues, so I, I agree on all the things that he has said. Uh, I think maybe he did not spend enough time on uh, the first which is on small business owners so I think he did talk about it in the sense of informal workers, but I think it's, uh, it's also clearer to talk about um, the impact on small business owners. So what we now call as MSME, so not just SMEs anymore, but the micro enterprises. Um, I think many of these have also been impacted seriously. Um, you know, those who own mom and pop shops, those who own, um, you know, very small businesses, uh, restaurants even. I think even these are, are impacted heavily. Uh, many of them are already highly extended on their loans and are unable to take any more. Um, so that's one. Uh, the second issue, um, which, you know, I, 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 Ideas has done a lot of work and research on GLCs. And um, the, the question was for me, what has the GLCs contribution been to the COVID-19 crisis? Um, I think the contribution to the COVID-19 crisis as well as to shared prosperity in the country more generally has been rather unclear. Um, there is an article that says that they've contributed, you know, uh, slightly, just slightly less than a billion ringgit uh, to the COVID-19 crisis. But these have come in the forms of only medical assistance. So, you know, providing additional um, finances to pay for extra PPEs and, you know, gloves and things like that. But um, I, I guess the question is, where are they in the ecosystem? And it seems to be rather limited in, the, in terms of what they have provided as assistance. I, I imagine that they could have done a lot more in also contributing to financial assistance in a larger way um, in supporting the government efforts. And the, the third point is uh, fiscal squeeze, right? So while I agree with Dr. Mohamed Khalid that uh, the government could have spent more, I think it was disingenuous of them to say that the stimulus package was as much as it was because actually a lot of it was in the form of moratorium. So the direct fiscal injection was quite limited. Um, so while I, I agree that government can be spending more, I think we also still need to recognize that uh, the government is under fiscal pressure. Uh, a lot of our revenues come from oil and gas contributions, about 19%. It used to contribute more, like over 30%, but now it's gone down to 19%. Um, and we know that Petronas has had an unprecedented loss of like 21 billion ringgit in quarter two. Um, we have not seen the quarter three numbers. In fact, we have not seen the quarter three numbers of the macro economy as a whole. So uh, understanding that fiscal squeeze is also where we need to really think about, you know, what's the correct um, tax base? What's the taxation system that we need moving forward? So those are the, the additional three issues on top of what uh, Dr. Mohamed Khalid had already pointed out. Um, so... I'll just talk about three kind of like policy directions that I think would be good for us to expand on during the discussion. So first is, um, yes, government social protection needs to continue to protect the most vulnerable that are falling through the cracks. Um, however, it needs to be very highly targeted. So because of the fiscal pressure, I think the solutions need to be highly targeted. And this is where information and data needs to come in. Um, data needs to be highly accessible you know, uh, decentralized in a way that all different government agencies can have access to it. Um, I know that some of the ministries can't even have access to some data, even though they are from within government itself. So the availability of data would be very helpful for not just interagency um, coordination, but also for the non-government sector to be able to know, okay, which groups are actually needing the most assistance now. Um, I think 
again, going back to the informal sector, everyone seems to be in agreement here that there needs to be a systematized approach to protect informal workers. Um, you know, these micro and small businesses, they do not have access to financial aid. Um, the SME soft loans, I think Dr. Mohamed Khalid said that the take up is quite low. And that's also because there are very stringent requirements. So you need to be able to show that your business fell by 50% uh, from before the crisis and uh, after the crisis. When in fact, you know, even before the crisis, many of them were already suffering because of other structural problems within the economy. Um, on social protection, I want to add something which is not that, something that not many people are talking about, which is that our social protection system is not institutionalized enough. A lot of our social protection is actually highly politicized. Um, in my own research, you, know, you can see very clearly that a lot of the assistance, the financial assistance from the federal government flows through elected representatives, right? It goes through members of parliament and they can apply from it uh, from the uh, prime minister's department. And we also know that it is highly politicized because once you are an MP that's not within the political coalition that's represented at the federal government, you lose access to this assistance. Um, and a lot of the constituents, especially in the semi-urban and rural areas, depend on social protection from their MPs. It's, uh, it's a sort of a, 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 a relic of the past, uh, if you would like, because of our patronage system and the fact that people actually go to, to their political heads uh, rather than seeking help from institutions. So that's um, on social protection. The second point is on job creation. So I think while we talk about social, social protection, and that's going to continue, I believe, for the next three to five years, um, especially as the country tries to recover from the pandemic, but, but over and above social protection is the need to look at creating new jobs. I mean, I think the economy was already facing structural problems before the crisis and the crisis merely exacerbated the, the structural challenges um, that our economy faces. So we go back to the economic conditions. How can we stimulate the business environment so that jobs can be created? And I think some of the quick wins um, which our research has been show, uh, showing is that you know, we really need to, to industrialize and upgrade our SMEs, uh, provide them with a sophisticated ecosystem to ensure that the recovery targets are hit. Um, what are some of those things? It would be to assist them in the digitalization process. Um, and that's already happening. I think government does provide some assistance, but it's really still not enough. And if you ask SMEs today, they don't really want to invest into digital because you know, they're barely making ends meet. Um, but how can the government play the role of encouraging, of nudging them towards that direction? And also um, attracting high value adding activities. So can we think about creating, for instance, a regional manufacturing hub in Malaysia within only high tech subsectors and also being selective in what kind of investments that we get. Finally, um, I can't emphasize this more, the need to have a clear and predictable rules-based environment. I think the MCO management has been very poor. I think a lot of the, the regulations and the announcements uh, have been very haphazard. They have changed as well. And this has made it extremely difficult for businesses to know how to operate. Um, even I, we're not really a business, but we run a small think tank. Um, have, I have found it very frustrating because the announcements from government, you know, are saying, you know, how many percentage of us can come into office and how many percentage of us can't. So it is it's the opposite of clear and transparent. Uh, there really cannot be at this point any halfway announcements and measures. I mean, this is the time to provide absolute clarity and already we are grappling at straws. And so we need to provide that transparent um, and accountable and clear announcements for the businesses to know exactly what they're getting. And I also want to um, highlight what Dr. Mohamed Khalid said about good institutions. Uh, completely agree that those are, those are sorely needed. But what exactly, um, you know, specifically can we talk about in good institutions? I would say that one of them would be to provide a more transparent public procurement regime. Uh, public procurement is, you know, as you know, a, a great source of corruption um, at all levels, at the federal, at the state and the local levels. And uh, finally, going back to the GLCs, um, I think GLCs can be depended up upon a lot more to achieve the country's social objectives and also to ensure that they are non-politicized. And we know that uh, throughout this year, we see a lot of the members of boards of directors as well as the heads of boards uh, being removed after the change in government. Uh, so I think the question is, you know, are our GLCs used for its intents and purposes? And also by putting politicians there, is that damaging the social objective uh, achievement? 
So I, I've laid out kind of three big issues that were not really um, emphasized on in his, in his presentation, laid out three policy directions. And I just want to add um, two more points, which is to agree with Dr. Mohammad Khaled that, you know, it's absolutely appalling that a country like Malaysia is going through such high stunting rates. I think our health and nutrition, especially for children, really needs to be looked at. Uh, they are the, you know, the future of the country. And the, the eco I mean, Malaysia is not quite a developed country, but we're not we should not be achieving, we, we should not be having that kind of stunting rates as we do. And that's because of the nutrition mix that they are getting. Um, as he said in the presentation, there's been a 40% increase in uh, what the consumption of instant noodles. And I think I saw the UNICEF report as well that shows that there's a negative 30% consumption of fruits during the MCO period, which means they're eating more instant noodles and they're, and they're eating less um, fruits and I, I suppose vegetables as well. So what's going to happen to the next generation. And finally, uh, this is also something that I, I personally believe that the mental health following from the, the uncertainties this year in 2020 uh, really need to be looked at as well because if you don't have you know, a, a population that is mentally healthy, uh, this is going to affect their ability to contribute to the economy as well. So uh, that's all from me. I hope it's been not too far uh, above five minutes, but uh, over to you, Bex uh, Stewart. Thanks very much, Tricia, and uh, Prof Jomo as well. There's obviously a, a very wide range of issues that we can discuss here, and how we're going to do that in about 40 minutes is uh, very difficult to, to foresee. But I think one I'd like to start with, because it's come up in, in all of your, your comments, so tax. Uh, I know tax isn't the sexiest comment, but it's, it's something that's integral to everything that's going on here. I think when we talk about a response or economists think about a response tax collection coming down, you think about social protection kicking in. But as uh, Prof Jomo mentioned, in terms of how Malaysia needs to tailor its response to its own circumstances, it doesn't have those buffers that uh, developed countries have. And, and Dr. Mohammed put that in his presentation quite clearly. Um, in fact, the latest data I, I've seen from the from MOF says that tax as a percentage of GDP has gone down further in the first half of 2020 to just 8.9%, um, which leaves the government with very little sort of fiscal ammunition to provide the sorts of wage subsidies and, and, and other measures, social protection. So, uh, and feeding that into the narrative around progressivity, I guess the question is... Um, uh, and I'll start with Dr. Muhammad on this because um, you made the link between tax and spending quite explicitly. I guess um, in terms of the tax reform of a, a future package to, to ward off the investment agencies, how do you see the mix in terms of how tax plays a role now versus preparing for the future? Because it's certainly an issue that needs to be addressed, but I imagine a lot of Malaysians will react and say, well, I can't pay more tax now in the middle of a crisis. Okay, thank you, uh, Stuart. Uh, I think it's not entirely correct to say that we do not have a buffer. We do have ample buffer. Our GDP, uh, debt to GDP is still low uh, compared to many countries, or even compared domestically uh, in history. Our deficit is still low. When you compare uh, during 80s, it was double digit. Mm -hmm. We have, if now is quite sensitive and quite difficult to implement uh, tax reform because not many people are making money, so you're not going to collect uh, from tax. But what is important, you can spend more. The government can borrow. You, you look at yesterday, UK uh, released the latest number, the highest debt to GDP in 30 years. We can borrow, and now the interest rate is too low. It makes no sense not to borrow. Why do you want to borrow? The, the, the thinking now is that you don't want, I, we do not want to borrow because we want, don't want to, uh, to upset rating agencies. We don't want to be downgraded and so on and so forth. The interest is too low at the moment. It makes no sense to conform to ensure that uh, the debt to GDP is very low, fiscal is very good, but people are dying, people have no jobs. What is important to ensure that people have food to eat and you have policies to create jobs? 
GDP per capita rating agency, you put aside first. The priority is to ensure that people are healthy, people can eat, kids can go to school safely, and you have jobs. Now, as Trisha uh, uh, mentioned, there's a lot of stress among Malaysians. And if I want to zoom into one group, it's a almost uh, mostly female-headed household, single mothers. Before the crisis, when we study uh, just in Kuala Lumpur, in low-cost flats in care, we did study with UNICEF. Before the crisis, the unemployment rate among single mothers was about 10%, one in 10 not working. During the crisis right now, one in three are not working. And we ask the stress level, 80% are mentally stressed. Only 2% said, we look forward to the future. We are very positive on the future. And we ask, do you get any assistance? We say we only get one time, 1,600. It's been six months. 1,600, you divide uh, by six months, nothing. We can spend, it's our obligation to spend. We have the buffer, we can borrow. Uh, Prof. Jeremy or Tricia, would you care to jump in on that? Well, I think um, what Dr. Mohamad said is quite correct. I mean, we have a serious problem which predates this crisis. We have had a, a situation where the sh there has been a sh steady shift, um, especially over the last 35 years or so, uh, in the direction of greater um, uh, greater tax uh, regressivity. Uh, my late friend uh, Ismail Saleh uh, pointed out many years ago that the Malaysian tax impact incidence on the public uh, is actually regressive and has become and became regress more regressive over time in the 60s and 70s. Uh, what uh, has been shown by other studies is that this has continued and has become much worse in the last 35 years or so. So the shift from direct taxation to indirect taxation um, has been quite popular, however, in the recent period, because when you're paying indirectly, you don't feel it so direct. Uh, and, and so politically, it is popular. But what it has meant is that the overall impact of the tax system has been regressive, and the tax collection has declined uh, for reasons which we have heard. Now, the big challenge, I think, um, in, in Malaysia uh, is not really to, to try to fiddle with the tax system in the middle of a crisis. Uh, you know, you, you don't do that. What you need to do is just get rid of this kind of antiquated thinking, uh, which says you have to tax first and then spend later. What you need to do is spend first and tax later in, in the middle of a crisis. That's what you have to do. There's no choice about it. And it's it's quite ridiculous for people to claim that there are fiscal constraints, as Dr. Mohamed has emphasized. The fiscal constraints are in the minds of, of, of uh, financial market analysts. They are, not, they are not real constraints by any comparative standards. Now, what has to be different, however, is the design of uh, what needs to be done in terms of stimulating uh, both relief, uh, enabling relief and recovery. I think if we think about what uh, what has to, what needs to be done? Uh, um, you, it has to be far more targeted to people who are largely ignored by the the current uh, slew of measures, and this I think is is crucial. This is where we need to learn, be humble, and learn from countries like Vietnam and and and, and Kerala and so on and so forth, uh, uh, and and you know where there's much to be learned. We, what we have done is to f is to mimic. Uh, measures uh, uh, in, in terms of trying to what, what has been happening uh, in Western economies. So this has been very unfortunate. I think also rather than think in terms of traditional Keynesian sort of employer of last resort measures, we really need to think of a different approach of what uh, some people have called a payer of last resort rather than employer of last resort. And this is especially important to, for dealing with the uh, relatively small econ uh, small businesses, uh, which are the most hard hit uh, by the by the current measures. So I think what the, the thing is to get away from is this kind of antiquated thinking about uh, uh, fiscal constraints. Move boldly but judiciously in terms of making sure that you're getting a bang for the buck, not just spending for the sake of spending or throwing money without re really 
considering the impacts of, of that additional spending. So we really need to be bold in terms of spending much, much more, as Dr. Mohamed emphasized earlier, and we really need to be to, to think anew about how to how to how to borrow. Right? The, 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 the central bank, for instance, can can easily buy uh, government debt from the Ministry of Finance. There's no need to go to, to markets and pay discounts, which is what is likely to happen in, in, a, in a situation like this. So you really need to think anew, uh, quite creatively. And there are people all over the world who are thinking about these kinds of issues. But if we take an ostrich in the sand approach, you know, and ignore what everybody is learning very, very quickly, we've had, you know, three, uh, three quarters of a year already uh, of, of, of COVID-19. And uh, as, as Dr. Mohamed knows, uh, we, uh, in, the, in the Economic Council, uh, uh, we pushed uh, and the prime, the prime Minister at that time uh, uh, wanted a, a, a spending uh, bill uh, much earlier, in, in February itself. He insisted on it. Um, and um, uh, unfortunately, as we know, the coup uh, meant that uh, there was a delay of a month. And all this basically slowed the whole process of providing relief as well as recovery. Um, so we, we really have to learn very, very quickly. And unfortunately, we are not learning. And the design, for example, of the latest measures, which have just been imposed today, uh, is, is really uh, 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 very, very counterproductive and hugely problematic. Excellent. It certainly sounds like we need to spend more. Um, Tricia, you want to weigh yeah. in? Um, I, I agree that this is not the time to, you know, during a crisis, try to impose more tax. But I do think that um, the problem of, of low tax collection has been identified even, you know, way before the crisis. And um, yes, it is crisis time. Yes, borrow more, um, spend more. But at the same time, we also need to, to think about revenues that are coming in and uh, some of the things that we have actually thought about proposing, which we've written some papers on, is you know, things like um, having a progressive capital gains tax. Uh, so these are just kind of thinking outside the box, looking at other additional measures that the country might be able to depend on, maybe not now, uh, but you're talking about, okay, long term, how much can we borrow and for how long? And, you know, yes, you're right that these limits are self-imposed, um, the debt limits, the, the deficit limits. But at what point do we want those limits? I mean, are, are those limits going to just, you know, continue increasing? So I think that those are just some questions that I'd like to pose. Um, and I know this is not probably the right time to talk about our GST, um, but the previous administration had introduced the GST, which was then eventually replaced by the SST. Um, again, this is perhaps not the right time to talk about it because we're in crisis mode, but we know that the, the SST does not, number one, collect as much as the GST, and that's where the government has also reduced its ability uh, to spend. And of course, the GST is just a much more comprehensive tax collection method uh, compared to the SST. So I'll just I'll just stop there for now. Yeah, and it's um, a, a couple of stats I like to throw in here just for the perspective of um, the audience. So uh, widely bandied around that less than 17% of individuals pay tax in Malaysia, uh, less than 5% of companies, and the in terms of the individual tax, so the median taxpayer in Malaysia pays about 1.5% of taxable income, they wouldn't be caught in the system. Uh, compared to say Poland, which is developmentally a quite similar country to, to Malaysia, that, that figure is 16.4% is what they would pay. So the difference is staggering and the arguments around affordability, uh, you know, Malaysians can't afford to pay tax, don't really hold much water. I think that's a neat place to segue into the social protection side of these things, as in if we have more tax or we borrow a lot more, what are we going to spend it on? There's a couple of uh, questions in the Q&A that I can feed into this, but part of it is 
So there's been a lot of talk of a social protection system, at least under the former government and for several years that Malaysia has needed one, but that hasn't quite come to fruition. Um, why is that so, I guess? Um, there's a question saying, um, you're all eminent uh, commentators in this space and advisors to the government. How come these, these messages are not coming through? And there's a technical, there's, there's the current sort of support for B40 compared to under the previous government and how that might fit into the, the response to the crisis. Um, maybe uh, Dr. Jomo, would you like to go first on that? Yes, uh, thanks, Stuart. I, I think it, it's important to emphasize that everybody in Malaysia is paying taxes, uh, albeit indirectly. What, what you are referring to are the income tax, uh, people who pay income tax, and that's only about a sixth of the population. Uh, in, in Malaysia as well as in Poland and so on. Um, it, but the, 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 the point really is, and this addresses Trisha's concern, that you know, if you have indirect taxation on the one hand, which actually affects everybody, yeah, and then you have direct subsidy payment, the ultimate form is pol political patronage. This is the heart of the problem. And this is precisely what has happened with, with the kinds of reforms which have taken place in the last three or four decades. And this is what needs to be stemmed from the outset. And I think unless we address this problem, we're not going to get anywhere. Now, as far as social protection is concerned, the last Deputy Prime Minister uh, did try uh, to, to organize uh, a, a reform of the social protection system. And as was pointed out, there are more than... Um, more than 80 different types of subsidies and grants and so on and so forth. What the, the existing system or non-system is a better way of describing it, uh, uh, is, is a bunch of different types of, of handouts um, which are used essentially for, for political patronage. Okay? Uh, and that, that, there's very little doubt about it. And so the, uh, developing, so instead of uh, having price subsidies, you have a, a subsidy in the form of a cash transfer recommended by the World Bank and all these other institutions, you basically are trying to develop a system of patronage. That is precisely what needs to be getting, gotten away from. You, you have to contrast, the costs of a system of patronage are huge because you have many machineries involved in trying to determine, including the machineries of so-called targeting, trying to determine who is eligible and who is not eligible, et cetera, et cetera. When you, in fact, have very, very, very effective uh, uh, means of, 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 trans of transfers, of making transfers already existed. About two decades ago, the Malaysian government introduced a MyCard system the MyCard system can be used to make transfers. It can be used for both taxation as well as transfers. All this could be done very, very effectively, and you could have a, a comprehensive uh, database uh, which would expose those who are, on the one hand, uh, in Dr. Mohamed's example, by, buying you know, huge Mercedes and, and BMWs on the one hand, uh, but hard, not paying taxes. Uh, on the other hand, you, you, know, you, you would basically have a, develop, a developed uh, data system. This is the way uh, things are going in the world today. But you would also need to do so with corporations because the biggest tax evaders in the world, as we all know, are corporations. Corporations pay a retinue of law lawyers and accountants basically to minimize liabilities. So we really need to get away from this kind of system and it can be done through very many of the reform measures which have been proposed uh, all over the world. Now what we, we need to think about in terms of what kinds of, of measures, of, of uh, subsidy measures are appropriate. I think I'm generally opposed to what are called social safety nets. What we need is a comprehensive system of social protection. But on the other hand, one has to think in terms of, this is a time, if there was any, where you do need a social safety net. COVID-19, the pandemic, the, lock, the imposed lockdowns and so on are so exceptional 
that you really need some very temporary, special temporary measures. It doesn't, that doesn't detract from the need to reform the, 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 the social protection system. And I very much appreciate the sentiment expressed on the panel, by the panelists about the need to do so. But that does not mean that you do not have some extraordinary measures given the nature of this particular crisis and given by the uneven nature of who is being adversely impacted. Most of the small inter uh, family enterprises, which Tricia and, and Dr. Moma talked about, are not going to survive at the rate things are going. They were struggling to come out. Many of them were struggling to get back into business uh, after, after the first uh, uh, so-called MCO in this country. And now, they, they, many of them, at least in the Klang Valley where I live, uh, where, which accounts for about two-thirds, uh, sorry, two-fifths of the nation's economy, uh, they are going to be so hard hit, I'm not sure whether they are, many of them are going to be able to survive. So we are talking about a almost apocalyptic type of impact in this country uh, due to the measures and, and, and uh, to handle this crisis and unless we develop some, a combination of both social protection reforms, which are very, very badly needed for the reasons everybody, all, all the panelists have emphasized, and then some, some appropriate relief measures, which are definitely needed because of the exceptional character of this crisis. Um, I just want to jump in here uh, of what Prof. Jomo has said. So, Okay, what, what do we know about the kinds of social protection that we have, right? So we've got, we've got SOXO, we've got EPF, uh, we've got our Jabatan Kebajikan, which is the welfare department, which runs like this database, which is supposed to be centralized, um, ikase, but the database is actually not, you know, the, like I said in my, in my short spiel earlier, that data is actually not made available to, say, um, some state governments, especially if your opposition runs. So the, the states actually are operating in the dark, like they don't know people in the, within this database? Are these people getting the kind of aid that they're supposed to be getting? Uh, and then we've got, like I said, uh, the MPs that receive aid from different ministries as well. So they've got like aid from the ICU in the Prime Minister's department. They're getting aid from the Ministry of Rural and Regional Development. And then in turn, the MPs give the aid downwards to their constituents. So there's a big bunch of things happening that's like... Uh, it is rather a mess, and I don't think anyone really has a comprehensive overview of all the different kinds of aid that exist. Um, you also have, say, from the Lebaga Zakat at the state level, and so someone, like an individual who is in the B40, who does deserve to get that, um, is, is possibly getting like three or four multiple different aid packages. I'm not saying that they don't deserve it, but there needs to be some kind of system that allows us to to indicate how much these families are getting because they might uh, be getting more over and above what another family, you know, that's, that's maybe in like the B20 should be getting. So this all goes back to the need to have data sharing and, you know, the way our government manages its data needs to be reformed. Um, I think MDEC and uh, Mampu are the two agencies that are supposed to reform the way data is managed and distributed. But it's just not happening fast enough. And during a time of crisis, this is really the time that um, these reforms need to be sped up very quickly. And, and as I said, it's not just government agencies that will benefit from it. It's um, the NGOs, it's the civil society. And I think we also see from the pandemic that it's not just government that has played a significant role in, in providing some of these. I wouldn't call it social protection because the social protection system should be managed by government. But they have been able to plug the gaps and if there was data available, this is where uh, the civil society could also make use of that and, and optimize um, to the, the vulnerable groups that need it the most. Yeah, absolutely. Um, data and, and, and I mean, there were two measures earlier this year around the poverty rate belatedly being raised and widespread praise for that and also in the context of the crisis, the um, the idea that the politically expedient, um, what goes for social welfare at the moment, was enabling payments to get out quickly, which is true. But as you've all pointed out, targeting is much more important in this space and having a coordinated system between institutions is something that um, 
would better target and, and better have a more holistic approach to social protection and welfare. Um, Dr. Mohammed, did you have any additional views on that? Maybe tying into the issue of institutions here um, more broadly. Uh, we've heard a lot, previous, you've mentioned previously around, we've got GLCs and, and their contribution. So I might sort of feed that one in too. Um, Certainly, uh, my reaction to, to Trisha's mentioning that around how GLCs can contribute more GLCs, um, shouldn't we be trying to get rid of those? But um, I'd, like to, I'd like to get your views on how GLCs and institutions and social protection, I guess, all sort of fit together in, a, in this crisis context and longer term in terms of reform. Maybe I answer like this. What we need, we can talk about the reform in taxation, the reform in social protection, but what the prerequisite of ensuring this happen, it, it, it executed well, is trust. People must have trust on the institution. People must have trust on policymakers. Governance matters. If you don't trust those in charge or you disrespect the law that being implemented, there's no point. Now the way it being seen, those in charge are either trustworthy, incompetent, or criminals. Hmm? Why should I then pay tax? If I pay tax, the money is siphoned off. Hmm? The rich do not pay, the poor has to pay, like Prof. Jomo uh, mentioned, is indirect tax action, covers all, why should I pay? Number, one. Number two, the law is not applicable, not equally uh, applicable to every, everyone. Yesterday, there's an uh, important case that if you certain stature you get away if you poor you get fine and you, you go to jail trust is important you can have a fantastic idea if people have no trust is a major issue so the governance side is important you need a good people to be there and the law to be applied uh, fairly if you don't have this is is uh, uh, no point so trust matters and in this current uh, period, people do not care either we're talking about, now we have the liberty to talk about what kind of debt level, uh, fiscal deficit, what level should it increase, debt to GDP, what level should it increase. Vulnerable groups do not have this luxury to discuss this thing. What they want, do I get the assistance or not? Does the assistance reach me on time? Is it efficient? Is it optimal? Now they do not have those assistance. So the government immediately, like Prof. Jomo mentioned and Teresa also mentioned, provide the assistance. Cash assistance is the easiest and fastest and that's what they need. Buffer, we have what we do not have. I have to choose my words carefully. Yeah? Maybe get rid of this, like Prof. Jomo said, this archaic thinking. Maybe I kick people, you know, I kick people doesn't mean old people, young people with I keep thinking. This is what we, we need. We need fresh thinking that put riot people as number one priority. I think that's what we need first. Otherwise, we can have good policies, nothing happen. Trisha mentioned about um, we have too many uh, assistance programs. We have 110 assistance programs cut across 20, uh, 20 odds agencies and ministries. We spend about 25 uh, billion minus CPF. Huh? Before the coup, Prof. Jomo mentioned this, the four deputy prime minister are in charge of this to coordinate all the social assistance, social protection. So we know who gets what and how do you make sure it's properly executed and more efficiently. But after the coup, we do not know uh, what happened. I want to go a bit brutal here uh, it's going to be very difficult for the vulnerable when it be seen those in charge uh, busy politicking than taking care of the riot and on top of that we do not want to spend i'm very very pessimistic moving forward even the budget they're going to announce in two weeks time still thinking of managing the deficit right yet well-being is number one. The rest is secondary. That's it. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for that. And I think you've inadvertently answered a fair few questions around uh, 
the informality, trust in uh, government. There's a few questions that are a bit political in nature around can these all be achieved under this government? I'll leave that one aside um, deliberately because um, that was probably <laughs> a better place for the political forum. Um, but maybe one topic I'd be keen to sort of dovetail into uh, digitalization was uh, mentioned earlier by Tricia in terms of um, it, it's obviously a key theme of this crisis that uh, people interactions are a risk. So the more things can be moved online, the better. Dr. Muhammad pointed out in his presentation the, the lack of access to technology and resources for schooling and the implications for education. Um, I guess uh, I just in a very general way want to open it up in terms of opportunities and challenges for Malaysia in this area of digitization, both in the crisis and preparing for the, the recovery. Um, happy to open to whoever wants to. Um, okay, well, I can go. Um, so uh, before I get into the digitalization part, I just before I forget, I just want to continue off where Dr. Mohammad talked about governance and trust in institutions. Um, it's true that whichever government of the day comes into place, uh, the trust in institutions needs to be there because if not, then people will just not be willing to subscribe to anything that the government is announcing. Um, no, nobody will want to pay their taxes. That's when the, the, the beginning of the tax evasion begins because uh, this is really just loose talk on the ground. If, I, if the government is going to be siphoning off the money, then why should I pay that tax to this government? Um, but there are some things that I think whichever administration is in power, they can do to restore trust. And I don't think even some of these were being fully addressed by the PH administration. Um, it did put some of this in its national anti-corruption plan, but as to how soon these things will be executed, one doesn't know. And some of these things would be, for instance, number one, you know, the political financing bill that would really reform the way political parties are financed in Malaysia. And you know, why am I talking about politics in a, in a panel that's supposed to be on economics? Uh, it's because our economics is politicized. You know, our social protection, everything that we've talked about earlier, it is politicized. So unless we can you know, regulate and all parties are on equal level playing field, where they get their money from, what they can spend on, uh, then you won't have this problem of, you know, siphoning off monies that will go into politicians' pockets, which would otherwise, could have been otherwise used for the benefit of the rakyat. So that's one. I think a second one would be, you know, reforms in our procurement system. I mentioned that earlier. A procurement is always, you know, time and again brought up in the, in the Auditor General's report um, year after year, or rather three times a year, because now they split it down to three reports. And you see that a lot of the government procurement takes place, um, in, in uh, highly compromised ways. And that could be another thing that they could do, you know, as a quick win, um, not just the government procurement, but I think we've also not talked about other, uh, another big thing, which is the mega projects that government, you know, regularly gets itself um, you know, tied to or it subscribes to. Uh, yes, these, these big projects are important, but, you know, what is the transparency around that? Um, where are the feasibility reports that, the public can actually download for themselves and see whether these projects are, are you know, wise going into and how much government is going to spend and how much debt is going to um, impose on itself for the long-term future. Um, and the third, I, I guess, the, so the, the top three would be, like I said, political financing, procurement, and the third would be like reforming of the GLCs, right? So uh, where are the GLCs in this? You know, what role can they play? Are some GLCs still relevant? You know, if they're actually competing against the very SMEs in the market that they're trying to grow and to flourish, then should they actually not be in that business anymore? But I think those questions and that analysis has not yet been comprehensively done. Um, so going back to digitalization, uh, well, the, the government has like this big 4IR program, right? Um, which I think the Ministry of uh, well, METI as well as the EPU are supposed to take charge of. And they are providing this like big digitalization grant for SMEs. But um, in order to get there, to qualify, to, to obtain these grants, they need to spend some of their own money. And I think that that already comes up to like more than 10K. And that's not something that they can afford to do right now. I mean, there are many of them are already in the red. So it's very difficult for them to, to take up these government grants. Um, but I think that ecosystem still needs to be provided 
from government, a lot of the SMEs that managed to get onto the digital bandwagon early have, have now, you know, they're, they're riding the waves because they managed to get there quickly enough. But there are many others that have fallen away. And I think if we just give them an additional push, they would be able to, to digitalize quickly enough and, um, and, and, and get the, reap the benefits from it. Uh, I think from what I've heard, there's been an increase of apps download for, for say, um, health-related apps where you're not so willing to go to the hospital to ask your doctor what to do, but um, you consult the doctor on your phone. Um, imagine if all of the Kedai Runcits and your, your, your um, hawker stalls are all like on your Grab app and you can get them immediately, then they would be able to survive because the only thing that I'm buying for lunch today, for instance, would be those that are available on the app. So if many of these can get digital, then they could perhaps just barely survive. It's interesting. That was actually something that, that worked fairly well, at least during Ramadan, the bazaars um, working with Grab and others. And it's a shame it hasn't really taken off as a model um, more permanently. And I, I thought myself on other things like how shopping malls can uh, help their smaller businesses to get online view via their sort of funds and centralised platforms and things like that. So, definitely an area that's underutilised and, and your point is well made in terms of all that may not be available to SMEs. Um, would either of uh, Dr. Mohammed or Prof. Joma want to jump in on digitization before we move on? Yeah, let, let me uh, suggest that I, uh, I, th I think we really uh, are paying too much attention to di digitization. This is, you know, I, I I've seen how uh, policy agendas have been taken over by the Davos crowd. You know, every year we look in January, thankfully this year, there's, Davos is not going to be what it was. But otherwise we've, you know, Industrial Revolution 4.0, Davos invented this, this myth. Digitization has been going on for at least my entire adult life. And, you know, and, and, and you can see the, how gray my hair is. <laughs> and, and not exactly new, okay? But we, we, we act as if all this is terribly new. In fact, companies, small enterprises are making decisions all the time as to whether or not digitization is in their own interest. And, and it's not as if they are ignorant of this. What we need to do, I think quite correctly, is to, is to enable them to be aware of the range of new technologies which are available digitization just being one of them. But we have also have to be very, very careful because digitization has often meant the increasing manipulation of our needs. You know, the whole idea of, of ordering your food through apps also involves the manipulation of needs. And this is now very well established for anybody who, 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 who is interested in what all this, uh, this new economy is all about. And, and we really need to begin to think about many other things. I mean, you know, Malaysia, for example, needs to think very seriously about what, now that food supply chains have been disrupted, what are we going to do as far as food is concerned? What are we going to do to address the nutrition concerns my two panelists have eloquently talked about? We need to do much, much more. We need to be able to supply much healthier food and get away from this single-minded preoccupation which dates from the colonial period of, you know, of rice self-sufficiency. There's much more to food security than rice self-sufficiency, and it should be combined with our concerns about nutrition. So there's a great deal which needs to be done in terms of pr producing much more food. And one of the things which Dr. Mohammed did when he was in government was to enable the, the, the government to, to address some of these, to think about some of these problems, to, to have a school feeding program for the entire uh, uh, for the entire nation, um, you know, for all children, you know, uh, and, and this was something which which was in in the in the at least in in some stage of discussion. Unfortunately, it has be, it has been hijacked. The you know such discussions have been hijacked, and they have not really gone forward. We have interministerial rivalries, so that the 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 food the food uh, meant the food. Uh, uh, which is being prepared by, by, by the Ministry of Education 
is not uh, overseen by the Ministry of Health and the food is not supplied in consultation with the Ministry of Agriculture. So the result is that you have, you know, a bunch of large food companies dominating this, this, these food programs. So we really need to th rethink, and I think the COVID-19, uh, you know, as, as a cynic would say, you know, you don't let a good crisis go to waste. And it offers us an opportunity to rethink a whole variety of issues involving governance, which we have heard a great deal about today, as well as the way we think about supply chains. And this kind of naive belief that somehow or other trade liberalization is going to save us is really misguided. You know, the, the, and this, 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 the situation we are in right now is a situation where, where jingoistic nationalism has, has, has been rising for the last decade or so, and we are not going to see an immediate reversal of this in, or for that matter in the, in the near future, regardless of the election results next, uh, in, in, in a couple of weeks' time in the, in the U.S., so we really need to begin to think of the very different world which we are in right now and to use this opportunity of recovery. I mean, what was called panjana by the Malaysian government was, you know, a half-hearted attempt. And I don't blame them, frankly, because it is very difficult to make sense of what should be the priority. But suddenly, for example, there are some obvious things which are staring in our face. Australia has made a deal with, with Singapore to supply, supply electricity from, from Northern Territory. Why aren't the ASEAN neighbors involved in supplying electricity uh, to Singapore? You know, we, 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 should, we should be beginning to think about the potential, for example, for developing much more. Malaysia is already the single largest source of photovoltaic solar panels, which are imported into the United States. Why aren't, why aren't Malaysian companies doing it instead of, of American and European and, 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 and Chinese companies? We, we really have to, to think about why we haven't done much, much more with uh, 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 palm oil-based uh, biodiesel. You know, uh, the Europe went, uh, went with biodiesel in 2006. And, uh, you know, for palm oil-based biodiesel does not figure at all in the European consumption of, of, uh, of biodiesel. So we really need to think out of the box and to think much more boldly. And this is an opportunity for fundamental reforms in a variety of areas. And unfortunately, we do not have the conversations which are needed in Malaysia um, to, 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 to take that process forward. Jeremy, thank you very much for that. Um, unfortunately, we're running short on time, so I'll take that as your concluding comment, but I'd, I'd throw to first um, Tricia and then Dr. Mohammed for a very quick sort of final thought on something that uh, a key takeaway that Malaysia should be focusing on. Right. Thank you, Stuart. Um, I just want to add that I think um, the problems of health or the lack of nutrition should not be the reason for us to reject digitalization because there can be other ways of ensuring that there is balance. So I could imagine that, you know, if I was a government agency providing incentives to Food Panda and Grab uh, to ensure that more of the healthy options are made available at first instance, when you open your app, you see the healthy options as opposed to the unhealthy options. I mean, that's just one idea that's randomly popped in my head, but my point is that uh, we should not reject something just because of another policy matter because I believe that there is a way that government regulators can nudge um, the market along rather than, you know, impose blanket bans. So, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that's not what he meant, but I'm just saying that there are ways around it. Um, so my concluding thought, I just want to, um, I guess, emphasize again the, the, the few points that I had at the very beginning, which is that, yes, social protection to protect the vulnerable groups, especially the informal sector. Uh, but even more importantly, think about, um, you know, creating a good business environment that can create jobs because ultimately you can't help everyone forever. We need to be able to have uh, the ecosystem that is naturally creating the environment that's right for you know, small and individual businessmen to, to start businesses, to you know, uh, have their restaurants and 
put their factories together again and then the jobs will come back so that when jobs are available, incomes rise. And finally, have a clear and predictable rules-based environment. I think that the governance angle is just imperative at this time. Um, there are many things that we cannot do because we're affected by the pandemic and the economy, of course, we're also caught in a global uh, crisis. But there are things that the government can do, right? And those are governance-related. So administration needs to get onto the low-hanging fruit immediately. Um, and contrary to what somebody said, I think in the in the Q and A, uh, I, I I am not unfortunately one of the advisors of government. Um, but of course, we do send our policy proposals to government, and we hope very much that they listen. Thank you very much. My uh, conclusion, or the um, uh, final say, is that the government shouldn't be stingy. They must spend. There's no point. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, we get good fiscal numbers, debt, lower ratings is good, interest uh, uh, deficit is good, but people are dying, people have no jobs. We can spend and we should spend. We, at the moment, we are not, contrary to what the term, or contrary to the term that we use, we are prihatin, we are not prihatin at all. How can you say we are prihatin, let's say for M40, we only give 500 ringgit. That's less than 7% of their monthly income. We are very stingy and we shouldn't be because we are a rich country. We have the resources to do it. If we do not change our policy, meaning we do not spend or we do not change certain people who's in charge who are clearly incompetent, I'm very pessimistic of the future. That's it. Well, thank you very much to you all, first and foremost, for joining in what's been an incred incredibly wide-ranging and stimulating debate. Um, we did have a number of questions, and apologies to those we didn't get to uh, your questions, but we did manage to cover a fair few uh, of your topics indirectly. Um, thank you very much to everyone for participating, um, both via the Q&A and as part of the discussion. Uh, a reminder that we have the cultural update tomorrow at the same time, uh, 10 a.m. Malaysian time, uh, 1, 1 p.m. Australian time. So uh, please do join us for that. Um, it will be an equally stimulating discussion. So thank you again to the panel and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.